piece of ground up there reminds me so much of the piece of ground in Zambia. You know, uh, that Kafula Futa, I couldn't tell you this side of eternity how many lives were changed on that piece of property. And you know what? We can say the same for that piece of property there. So God is just doing something amazing, and not just with ADP Sports, not with the community coming here and us going to them, but with every facet. There's something about that. So praise the Lord. I know there were some professions made. I know there's some youth that now know Jesus as their Savior. And we're going to talk about today what to do next, right? And uh, please continue to pray for those who came back from Honduras. Oftentimes when you're on a trip like that, you're on a mountaintop, right? And, and it is a mountaintop, and it's a wonderful time. It's something that we, you pray and wish you could take everywhere with you. But oftentimes it comes after that are some valleys, and the adversary tries to just, am I not on? There it is. I just allow, hey, I'm starting to get as loud as you. You know? Please stand by if we have te- technical difficulties. How you? Okay, now we're on. All right, here we go. And I didn't push any buttons from first service till now. I don't know. All right, so now where was I? Yeah, so Honduras trip. Um, God did some amazing things there. So please pray for that team as they've been back, because the attacks will take place, um, and the adversary will try to destroy them but also pray for those who made professions of faith over there. Um, And then at the end of today's service, uh, Randy Adams is going to come up and close out the service because he's going to share with you another opportunity that the church body has when it comes to a mission trip, okay? Um, And so uh, please, uh, maybe even in your heart right now, God is kind of moving you to think about being a part of that. You know, what's been really good about this, uh, this Take It Personally series, if you brought your book, you know, I hope you brought it, um, but uh, what's really been neat about it, I just thought about it today, is that um, it's really connected to, uh, you know, when you look at the vision of our church, to live faith, love others, and declare hope, you know. Every facet of this series have been a part of that vision, living the faith of the Son of God, right, and loving others. Why? I mean, if you love people, you're going to share them the good news. You're going to share with them something that can change their lives. And, and declare that hope, de- declare the hope of Jesus Christ. And so I just thought about that this morning, that this all goes along with the vision and direction that God is taking us. And I hope you can grasp that. Um, the, last, the week before last, we, in, in the book, in the series, we talked about making a difference. And we discussed about the value of one soul. Amen? How important one person is. Uh, enough to where Jesus Christ and His only begotten Son, even if it was just for one person but it was for all of us. That's how important you are to God. And then last week, which was really good, we talked about presenting the gospel. And we talked about each facet of doing so to lead a person to a place of decision. And if you were here last week or if you saw online, a wonderful opportunity where we got to see Sean Summers share the gospel with somebody in Honduras. So not only did we learn about it here, but we got to see it actually in action. And uh, please, please continue to pray for that man, too, because now he's a new believer in Christ. Um, and so the presentation of the gospel is very important. And we, if you remember, we talked about two different questions that are found in the Bible. We just talked about it quickly. We didn't spend a lot of time. But there are two questions in the Bible that are asked of, that really goes along with where we're at and where we're going. And the first one is this, Acts chapter 1630. Do you remember this from last week? In Acts 16.30, um, the Bible says here, and let me get over there, Acts 16.30, it says, and he brought them out and said, sirs, what must I do to be saved? So right now you have Paul and Silas are in jail. God has miraculously opened the, uh, opened the gate or opened the jail cell. And they're getting out. And uh, the Philippian jailer sees all this happening and he's shooken. His life is now have been shaken. Uh, shook That's right, we're shooken, right? He's been shook, shook, that's it. His life has been shook. And, um, and then he asks this question, what must I do to be saved? And I like verse 33, it says, and they said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. So that's the answer to that question. Whether today, that's the dispensation that we're in right now, whether Jew or Gentile, 
That's how a person gets saved. It's by believing on the name of Jesus Christ. That's how a person gets saved, can spend eternity with the Lord. And we talked about the different pieces that a person must know. And so the first thing we want a person to know is that God loves them, right? A person needs to know that they are loved by an everlasting God who loves them. And we know that by John 3.16, he sent his only begotten son. Also recognize their condition. They need to know their condition, how they stand before holy God. And how do they stand? Well, they stand before them lost, as their righteousness is as filthy rags. They are, um, there's none righteous, no, not one, right? All have fallen short of the glory of God. You see, a person needs to recognize that peace in their life, how they stand before God himself. And then the third is notice the price for sin. They have to notice the penalty. God has set a price for that sin, and then we know that the wages of sin is death. So that person needs to understand that their sin has caused them to have a spiritual death that will keep them separated from God for all of eternity. But then you get to the point to where they have to just believe in Jesus Christ, that Jesus Christ died for them. They have to believe that Jesus Christ died, he was buried, and he rose again for them. That if thou shalt con- or I'm um, but God committed his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Remember we talked about last week how, how a person has to, have to get their life right before they go to God. They have to go to God, the great physician, to help them or to get their life right. And then that last piece is confess their faith in Christ. They have to get to that place. That's how simple he made it. He made it so simple that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and believe with all thine heart, thou shalt be saved. It's that simple. That is how a person today, in a very simple way through the book of Romans, you can lead someone to Christ. And then that decision, they have to make that decision. But today we move to the next side. We move to that next question. And the next question is this, is Acts 9, 6. Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? In Acts chapter 9, verse 6, we know that Paul the apostle was on his way to Damascus. And he met the Lord on that path and on that road. And this is that when he saw that light coming around him, that was the first thing he said, or not the first thing, but he did say, Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? See, that should be a natural response to the new believer. Lord, what do you want me to do next? And that's exactly what we're going to talk about today, how we as a church should understand how we need to lead the next, that believer to a place where they might ask that question and help them to answer that question. Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? So what do we do next? The next thing we do is establish a new Christian. Now, I know that says establish new believers. I put believers on there, and I never changed it back to Christian. But in your book, it says establishing new Christians, right? And that's okay, because they're pretty much the same thing, a new believer and a new Christian. And so that's our responsibility as a church. So when you think about a newborn babe being born physically, right? That newborn baby comes with a lot of responsibility, wouldn't you say? And when Dwayne was here, I said, hey, or a puppy. Dwayne just got a puppy. And that puppy is keeping him up at 1 o'clock, 3 o'clock, 4, you know, wanting to be taken outside. So puppy, you can put it there too. If you've never had a child, but you got a puppy, right? But having that child, that child takes a lot of responsibility to raise. And when you bring that baby home, it's just a little bundle, bundle beautiful ball of flesh is what that child is. That child, all he does is cry out. I just, feed me. It's a very selfish child. We've all been there. We just want to be fed. We just want to be taken care of. We want to be cleaned. That's what a baby is like, right? And so it takes responsibility of the parents um, to be able to take care of that child, to be able to provide the needs for that child. Well, there's nothing different when it comes to a spiritual newborn baby. It's a big responsibility in order to be able to raise up this child uh, in the church and in Christ so that they know what they're supposed to do next. They know how they are supposed to move. And left to themselves, if you you take a baby and you set it aside, obviously left to themselves, that, that physical baby will end up dying. Well, the same thing happens spiritually. Now, I don't mean that 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 newborn babe in Christ will lose her salvation, but they can die spiritually where they become now malnourished and they go out in this world and they're filling themselves with the things of the world that are contrary to what scripture says that a new believer should be indulging in, right? 
They should be indulging and feasting on God's words. It's like if you take a, a newborn baby and you put them into a billionaire's home, that physical baby is now in a billionaire, has all these privileges, has all these luxuries awaiting them, but they have no idea. They're just a baby. Whether you feed that baby with a golden spoon or whether it's just a tin spoon, they don't care. They just want to be fed. They don't know the difference between what is feeding them. They just want to be fed. But as they start growing, they start realizing the privileges and the, what they have access to. And they start indulging again on the things of this world. And that's the way that they're looked towards. That's how they're brought up. Well, you know, the same thing happens to a newborn babe in Christ. There are some spiritual blessings that take place in them, but they have no idea what they are. They don't know what they are. They don't know what they have at their fingertips. They don't know the privileges that God has given them. They don't have any idea that they are heirs to Christ, that what God is theirs is what God has is theirs. They have no idea. And it's our church, our responsibility, church, is to help them understand what that is and guide and direct them. Now, at this time, Satan starts attacking, but he's doing it in a different manner now. He's trying to undermine the work of God's Spirit in their lives. He, he can no longer have their soul, but he can have their joy. He can steal their joy. He can take away from them what God has given them through the Spirit and cause discouragement in their life, right? And if he can get a new believer to be discouraged, then they're not going to go out and share their faith. If, they can, if he can get an older believer to be discouraged, they're not going to go out and share their faith, right? But now his tactics has changed. His strategy has changed. He is trying to keep a new believer from sharing their faith. Our job now is just beginning. This is just now the beginning of the church. We are to point them and lead them to a place of holiness, right? That's what we're supposed to be doing. You know, we see something about the holiness of God today. And I love that word holy. Outside of the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, holy is my favorite word. I love the word holy because it's perfect. It's complete. There's, there's no guile. There's nothing there that can cause any imperfections. And I know myself. I know how imperfect I am. And so I know that I can go to a God who is tempted in all points as we are yet without sin. So he has every answer to every question I would have. He has every solution to every problem I might face, right? That's why he's so, I just love that holiness of God. And we want other believers to understand and to take part of this. A Christ-likeness is a lifelong process. It's something that happens from the day they're born all the way till they take their last breath. And God wants us as a church to be a part of that process. We're to be involved in this from the beginning to however long God would have you in their life, that is our responsibility. And I hope you see it as that. And you're willing to step up and say, yes, I want to get involved into someone's life. And that's, you know, like I've heard before, uh, I think, it, um, who did I hear this from? Roger Zink. And I know it's a famous saying, but um, the journey of a thousand miles starts with the first step, right? We understand that. But that's what it takes when it comes to imporing their life into somebody else, leading them to Christ and pouring your life into them. A new believer needs clear direction and guidance. So we move to this first point here, early instruction. If you have your Bibles, turn them to First Thess or, I'm sorry, e Ephesians chapter 1. That's where we're going to be to look at some passages here. Early instruction comes from God's Word. It's, it's godly biblical instruction. We don't want to use the ways of the world to try to guide somebody. We want to use God's word, that which is spiritual. And we want them to understand their assurance of salvation. And one thing I love about Ephesians here, when we look through, we don't have time to read the entire passage, but look at verse three. It says, blessed be the God and the father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. See, we, you and I, the church, has been blessed with all spiritual blessings. Not just some, but anything that is spiritual, that is of God and from him, he wants you to partake of that. It's yours for the taking. But if we don't figure out what it is, it's at our fingertips, but we'll never actually grasp it, okay? And so those blessings, just as a, a billionaire might give uh, 
uh, uh, this child uh, worldly so-called blessings, God wants to give us, and he has given the church these spiritual blessings. So God promises to save all who call upon him for salvation. Amen? That means he's never going to reject anyone, anybody that comes to him. So he wants to give you an assurance. He wants to give the lost people of, of Blue Springs and your neighborhoods, he wants to give them an assurance of acceptance. He wants to let them know you are accepted into my family. Look at verse uh, 6. It says, To the praise of the glory of his grace, wherein he hath made us accepted in the beloved. You are his beloved. Amen. You are it, this church body right here. And all those who have placed their faith and trust in Jesus Christ are part of the beloved. beloved. And you have been accepted into this beloved. That means you'll never be rejected. That means you'll never be pushed away. The Bible says in Romans 10, 13, for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. That's whosoever. Doesn't matter uh, uh, race. It doesn't matter anything. All that matters is, is if you truly believe and trust it in Jesus as your Savior, you are accepted. Look at Ephesians 1, 13. It says, In whom also, in whom ye also trusted, after that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also, after that ye believed, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit, a promise. You were sealed with the Holy Spirit. See, that's another spiritual blessing. There's nobody that ever can come along with God's hand and rip you out of his hand. It's not going to happen. And it says here that the Holy Spirit, it was, he sealed you with himself. You're sealed with the Holy Spirit. He is the glue that keeps you together. He is the glue that keeps you in this beloved. But I love Ephesians 4.3 because it also says that you're sealed by the Holy Spirit. You're not just sealed with him, but you're sealed by him. The power of God, of the Holy Spirit, he has put you. No one can ever rip you out of his hand because he is the glue, but yet he's the one that sealed you himself. See, he is active in your salvation. He is active in your eternal security. He is active in your acceptance. And it feels good to be accepted. Nobody likes to be rejected, right? I still remember back to when I used to play kickball on the field, you know, at, at, in my elementary school. I wasn't always the first to be picked. I was a short little guy. I still am a short little guy, right? And I was last most of the time, but I still enjoyed it. But nobody, I wanted to be accepted. Accept me here, but you know what? And that's okay. That's okay because I know God has accepted me. And so the early instructional piece is that we, he wants everybody to know assurance of salvation. He wants them to have assurance of that acceptance. And we see here the second one, eternal life is forever. He wants you to understand that there's an assurance of a destination. You have an, look at first, or I'm sorry, Ephesians 1.10. I keep saying first. I've been reading through the book of Thessalonians, and I keep thinking first Thessalonians, but it's Ephesians. So look at Ephesians 1, verse 10. It says that in the dispensation to the fullness of times, he might gather together in all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are in earth, even in him. See, this passage is talking about the time when we're going to be raptured out of here. And those that are on earth and those that are in heaven, he's going to bring us together, okay? There's a destination that we are headed to. Now, I understand the Bible teaches that, that he's going to create a new heaven and a new earth and, and we'll be with him, yes. But I really believe that our destination is not a place, it's a person. Because the Bible says that we're forever going to be with our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Absent from the body, present with the Lord, right? 1 Thessalonians 4.17 says this, Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Again, another reference to the rapture, that we're going to be caught up with him. And those who have already gone before us are coming down with the Lord. And it says right here that, um, it says right here that, we will meet with them in the clouds. We're not just going to meet him. We're going to meet them. We're going to be together in this beloved. And that last part here says, we ever be with the Lord. That's forever. See, it's not a place. It's a person. That assurance of a destination. Eternal life is forever and it's with our Lord. And then this third one here, being born again makes you part of God's family. This is assurance of a sense of belonging. 
Now, these three assurances that I've been talking about, you won't find them in your book. They're just the notes and things that God had led me to as I was studying this out. But being a born again makes you part of God's family. It's part of the beloved. You know, I've heard um, testimonies before of, of gangs, gang members. And um, when they enter into a gang, a lot of the times the reason they do is because they find a place that they belong. Many times they're rejected, whether by family, society, whatever it might be, and they just want a place of belonging. And they, they say, you know, we're my family. And there's so much of a family, they're willing to die for that family. They're willing to shed their own blood because of whatever situation might be taking. That's a lot of dedication. That's a lot of commitment, you see. You know, we're called to do the same thing, but we're not called to shed our own blood. Sometimes God calls that in people's lives to be a martyr, but we are called to take up our cross. We are called to, to, to walk and follow Jesus Christ and take up our cross on a daily basis. You know, living in this family will not be easy. We talked last week about easy believism, that it's easy. There's a, and what that means is just to tell somebody, oh, you, all you have to do is say this prayer, receive Jesus Christ, and you can go on about your life. Well, that's not what Scripture teaches. Scripture teaches us that we ought to take up our cross daily. It's going to be a difficult life. It's not going to be easy. We cannot enter into this thinking that it will be. We've got to take up our cross. And see, you've got physical illustrations of like gangs who do these things. But we spiritually are do the same, but we're to do it for righteousness and not unrighteousness. See, God's family is now who we are a part of. And he wants you to know that. First John 3, 1 says, Behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed upon us, that we should be called the sons of God. See, we have families this side of eternity, broken families. And I think everybody, either you're in one or a part of one or you grew up in whatever, we're all been affected by this some way. And no matter how good our family is, there is dysfunction in some level because we live in a fallen world, right? And so not everybody understands what it means to have a father or a good mother or a family. But when we approach this from the beginning point of Scripture, this is the perfect way a family ought to look. We do have a father. And when you see that we are sons, that means there's a family. And we have entered into this family, and we are called the sons of God. That comes with great responsibility, but it comes with great privilege. Ephesians 3, 14 through 15 says this, For this cause I bow my knees unto the Father, our Lord Jesus Christ, of whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named. See, there's a family in heaven and earth that is named. It's the beloved. It's us, right? And I like it because he says, for this cause. Well, what cause is he talking about? Well, when you read the book of Ephesians, you understand that he's talking about a great mystery. A mystery is something that's been revealed. And this mystery is that we, the beloved, the church, are in him. We are in Christ. He also says here that he talks about the manifold wisdom in this book. And, and this means the exhibited wisdom during different times and different ways. He says, because of this, I bow my knee before my father. Because of this, I am a part of this family and he says, of whom the whole family of heaven and earth is. You see, we're part of this family. This is where we want to lead these new Christians. They have to understand that they are a part of something huge, bigger than this world could ever offer. Amen? Once we move from there, we go to baptism. We talked about baptism already the first and second week. So we won't spend a whole lot of time here. But remember, we're approaching it from the way of, what wilt thou have me to do? And see, a new believer needs to understand that the next step is baptism. They've already received Jesus as their Savior. Now they need to take that next step, which is baptism. Baptism, as we've already talked, is of identification. It's an outward expression of an inward decision. You've already, you're showing outwardly that you belong to the Lord. You're showing outwardly to the people that I am married to my Lord Jesus Christ. And I want to show the whole world that I belong to him. And I believe I said this before, it may have been last week, that whenever a person gets saved, they're committing their soul to the Lord. But when they, um, um, after salvation and when it comes to baptism, they're committing their life. And so that can be just as a big 
deal is salvation. And so sometimes people are fearful of, of taking that step. You know, I've heard um, parents sometimes say that, uh, you know, I don't know if my child can understand baptism. And my answer to that is if your child can understand salvation, they can understand baptism. You just have to explain it to them and help them understand what it means, and what it identifies, you know. It's like that wedding ring. When I got married to Tammy, I put a wedding ring on. The wedding ring doesn't make me married. It's just a symbol that I am married. That's exactly what baptism is. It's a symbol that you belong to Jesus Christ. But then it also identifies you with the local New Testament church. Okay? In Acts 2, 41 and 42, it talks about this. It talks about, it says here, they that gladly received the word were baptized. All right? So some of you have been just recently through the Discover class, and we have talked about what it means to be a member of a local New Testament church. Well, three things. Salvation baptism, and agreeing with the doctrines of the church. You, you have to understand and, and agree with what we believe. Can two walk together except they be agreed? No, if they, they, if they don't agree, then how can you walk together? And so baptism is a very important piece when it comes to just um, being a part of that local New Testament church. Baptism is for every Christian. There are very few reasons why a person should not be baptized. There are some but there are very few. There's actually something out there where people can be um, uh, allergic to water. I don't think we're going to run into that. I guess we could, but there's an actual term for it. So I'm sure God will understand that and work through that. But, you know, sometimes it's just not water, right? In Zambia, during the dry season, you get out there and you get out in the bush and you're far away from any stream, there is no water. Then you have to wait for the water. Okay, no big deal. I got saved November 1999. And, um, and I did not get baptized till May of 2000 because there, we just didn't have any water. We were meeting at Vesper Hall here in Blue Springs. Once a year, they brought in a cow trough, and I was baptized in a cow trough, right? And that's okay. And it just, that's the way we did it then. But once a, once a month, often we have baptisms that take place right here. So there's always, uh, there's never really a reason to not be baptized. Fear is not a reason to not be baptized. You know, the Bible says in Psalm 31, 24, be of good courage and he shall strengthen your heart, all ye that hope in the Lord. I know there are people that are fearful of getting up in front of other people to be baptized. But once you became part of the beloved, once you entered into that family, you have something that this lost world doesn't have. You have the hope of Jesus Christ inside of you. You have the spirit of God inside of you who will encourage you. It gives you the courage according to the scripture. It gives you the strength in order to do so. So fear is not a reason to not, to not be baptized. Baptism should be by immersion only, and I think we all understand this. Baptism is a picture of the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. You can bury somebody by sprinkling dirt on them. It doesn't happen. You know, when you're buried, you're fully immersed. They put, I've seen it many times in Zambia. You know, over in Zambia, it's not like here. They don't understand our funerals. They don't understand them at all. But over in Zambia, while you're there at the funeral and while you're standing, they cover up that casket fully with the dirt while you're there. Well, that's not something that we're used to this side, right? But that's what they do there. So I've seen coffins being buried. They didn't just sprinkle dirt. They completely buried it. Well, that is exactly what happened, or the picture when you're baptized. You are, you are picturing that you are now dead in that old man. You were buried with Christ, and now you're raised in the likeness that of Jesus Christ. That old man's passed away, and you are now put, placed on that new man. That is the picture of it. So there's, there is no sprinkling of dirt. When you see in, in the Bible, they always go down into the water, and they come up out of the water. So baptism is by immersion. But baptism should also take place soon after salvation. When you look through the book of Acts, it happens right after. They don't, they don't wait very long at all. Um, there's no reason to wait if you don't have to. And so, um, again, we had already talked about the fear. You can't use that as an excuse. God has not given us a spirit of fear, but a power and of love, a sound mind. You don't have that fear. He's taken it away. That's a lie from, the, from our adversary, okay? And so another reason is it's not about a person, and it's not about a place. It's about Jesus. 
Sometimes people wait because they want a specific person to baptize them or they want to go to a specific spot. You see, when we do this, we're making it about man. We're not making it about God. We have to make it about the Lord. So if we know that that's the first step of obedience, then we need to take that step and we need to move forward and not be fearful. And, I, and there's probably maybe some of you here right now, and my, my question is asking you, what are you waiting for? You know, come forward, get baptized, show everybody you belong to Jesus Christ. And then Bible reading and prayer. When we looked at baptism, baptism is, co- is about commitment to the Lord. But Bible reading and prayer, it's about communication. Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? Well, he wants you to read and he wants you to pray. These are very, very simple things. Two is probably the most important things when it comes to our walk with the Lord, but it's probably what we do the least. We always find something else to get in the way. We can always talk ourselves out of it and live off yesterday's bread rather than the bread he wants to give you today. And we should not do that. We've got to be active and involved in his word. You know, how can you know specifically Lord, what the Lord wants you to do if you don't spend time with him? Now, you can go by what everybody else says, and there's nothing wrong with preaching and teaching in the word and listening to sermons and listening to music, and there's nothing wrong with that at all. But you have to have that intimate one-on-one time because he has something he wants to speak to you specifically. He wants to talk to you specifically. He doesn't always want to talk to somebody, through somebody else. He wants to talk to you. And that's why I love uh, Paul the Apostle here in Philippians 3.10. He says that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his suffering being made conformable unto his death. See, Paul's desire every day was to know God. Is that your desire? When you get out of bed every morning and your first thought, God, I just want to know you a little bit more today. And tomorrow I want to know you more. See, you want to get to the place where you know him so well that when you're tempted with something, immediately thought is, no, that will not make my God happy. I can't do that. That doesn't draw me close to God. That, that, that drives me away from him. You see? And the more you spend time with him, the more you're allowing the spirit of God to work and to bring that conviction. So you'll know what you're supposed to do when you're supposed to do it or know what you're not supposed to do when those temptations come. He wanted to know him. He wanted to know the power of that resurrection. That's a lot of power to be able to raise dead to life, right? But that's exactly what we have to do daily. Um, we talked about it already. We've got to take up, take up our cross daily and follow him. That means we have to die to self. We have to crucify the flesh and say no to what our flesh wants in order to say yes to what God wants. Being made conformable unto his death. He just wanted to experience the same things that, God, that, that Jesus Christ experienced. So when you break it down to its basic elements, this is it. It goes deeper than this. But when you break it down to its basic elements, prayer is our communication with God, and God is communicating with us. Again, it goes further than that. But there will be no communication if you're not reading and you're not praying. Church attendance is very important for the new believer. Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? He wants him to go to church. He wants him to be a part of family. See, this provides teaching for the new believer. It, It equips the new believer. It educates them. It edifies them. Ephesians 4, 11, and 12 says, and he gave some apostles and some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers for the perfecting of the saints, the work of the ministry, and the edif- edifying of the body of Christ. You see, this is why the church exists for a new believer, to help them to grow in, in this world, to know how they ought to live their lives, that equipping, that educating, that edifying. And you know, our church is equipped with everything that we just talked about. You know, for a new believer, a good place to start is one-by-one discipleship. If even for an, an older believer, if you've never been through one-by-one discipleship, where someone has had God invest in them and then they're investing in you, that's a great place to start. That's where we direct these young believers. If you're interested in knowing how to reproduce yourself, that opportunity is here. Or how to lead. There's different things set up in this church to teach you how to be the, the leader that God has called you to lead. If you just want to know and to prepare and to grow in the Lord, we have Acts 1-8 Bible Institute. You know, that's getting ready to start up next month. And we have three courses that are are going to be taught over here. There's going to be eschatology, which is the end times. There's going to be the book of Genesis, and then the life of Christ. 
the opportunities are all around us. You just have to take that first step. And see, and that's the direction that we want to really point new believers towards. But it also provides fellowship. Um, Hebrews 10, 25 says, Not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some, but exhorting one another so much the more as you see the day approaching. Church, the day is approaching. It's getting closer and closer. They've been saying that for a thousand years. Yes, and it was closer and closer then too. But it's even getting closer and closer now. So what does the Bible say? Because it's getting closer and closer, we need to get together more and more. We need that edification. We need that encouragement. Because there's a lot of crazy things happening out there right now. And we need to be able to edify and help one another walk through them. We've got to be willing to be involved in their lives. So now we go to point two. That was just point one. We're in point two. I promise you, though, we'll, we'll go a little bit faster through point two and three. When it comes to nurturing growth, on page 35 there, talks about fellowship and hospitality. You know what we got to do to be with these new Christians? We've got to love on them. We've talked a little bit about fellowship, but that hospitality. A new believer is a stranger. Nobody knows them very well. We don't know them. They don't know us. And that's exactly what hospitality is. It means generous to guests. It means love on strangers. We have to be there for them in order to love on them and encourage them. 1 Peter 4, 8, and 9 says, And above all things, have fervent charity among yourselves, for charity shall cover the multitude of sin. Use hospitality one to another without grudging. You, that, that charity is love in action. We have to show them love and not just tell them, but show it to them. And guess what? A, a, a new believer is going to have some struggles at times. They may make some poor choices. And that love is going to cover that multitude of poor choices they might make to show them that they are still loved, not only by God, but they're loved by the church. And then it says here also um, to, do, to, to show this type of love without grudging. We should do it because we want to, not because we have to. Church involvement. You know, we, many opportunities, we need to show them that there is a place for them within this church. Ephesians uh, 4 talks about fit and supply. They fit within this church, and one of these days they're going to know how they can supply the needs to the church and their gifts and talents that God has given them. But until that day comes, we get them involved. We have ADP sports. We have prayer groups. We have small groups. So many opportunities to show them where they can be involved. Discipleship is so important. We've talked a little bit about that when it comes to one by one. But this is talking about teaching and guiding them and helping them. I love John 3, 4. It says this, I have no greater joy than to hear that my children walk in truth. When you have the opportunity to lead someone and then to train somebody up and invest, and then you just sit back and you watch them walk in truth, wow, that's a joy. And that's a joy that God wants all of you to experience. See, discipleship, it all starts with salvation, but then it's a growth, maturity, all the way to holiness, to that place of Christ. Point three here is committed to multiplication. See, multiplication is more than just discipleship. It is also salvation. If I go out and lead someone to Christ, but then I don't teach that person how to lead someone to Christ, right? Then it's just going to be me adding. But if you teach someone how, and then they go out and teach someone how, it eventually becomes multiplication of evangelism. And then from that point, it will turn into multiplication of discipleship if we properly teach people discipleship. Even Acts 9 talks about this multiplication. And at the end of this verse, it says, and we're edified, walking in the fear of the Lord and the comfort of the Holy Ghost, we're multiplied. There's edification and walking in that fear and the comfort of the Holy Ghost. These are all ingredients of something natural that happens, that and that natural, that thing that happens is called multiplication. When we're putting these ingredients together in the life of a person and into the church, naturally people are going to go out and share the gospel. There's that intentional involvement. The word intentional means designed with purpose. That means uh, going out with a purpose, and you've already made that design in your mind, and you've been taught and trained, and so you've, you've put it, I, I'm going out with a purpose here. We've got to encourage a new Christians to invite others to church. When was the last time that we've invited individually people to church here? And don't answer that, obviously, but when was the last time you invited someone to church? When was the last time I've invited somebody to church? Yeah, I'm saying that to myself. 
that's something that we should be doing and encouraging new believers to do the same. When we lead someone to Christ, we need to teach them how to lead others and invite others to Christ. Invite a new Christian to go soul winning with you. Next week with Salt and Light, we're going to have that opportunity. If you are discipling someone, this would be a wonderful time for you to take your disciple by the hand and say, hey, let's go soul winning together. And you teach them how to go out and do so. Because it can be intimidating. But once the person sees the importance of doing God's work and fulfilling God's great commission, it can become part of their life. And then offer to help that new Christian to share the gospel with friends and relatives. Mark 6, 4 says this, But Jesus said unto them, A prophet is not without honor, but in his own country, and among his own kin, and his own house. What this is saying is, as oftentimes, a new believer, they don't have a voice in their home. Their family might always see them as just that person in their family. They may not see the changed life, so they may not have a voice. So offer, give them the opportunity to be able to, or, uh, to be able to sit down and say, hey, would you like me to come? And I'll be more than happy to share with your family what happened with you or share with your friends what happened with you in your life. Private prayer is so very important. Private prayer. We pray for the salvation of many. I have a list of people I've been praying for. Just recently, I've been able to write down the dates of their salvation. That's a beautiful thing. I hope you guys experienced that, that date written down there. But oftentimes, we stop praying for them after their salvation. You know, in Paul's prayers, and please continue reading through Ephesians, because the last half of Ephesians chapter 1 shows Paul's prayers. And if you go through and you look at all of his prayers he prays for the church, I would say 99% of the time, he's always praying for their spiritual growth. Very rarely does he pray about any of the physical, because that's what it comes down to. We put in too much focus on this world and not on God and not on eternity, on spiritual things. Paul was concerned for the spiritual growth of the new believers and of the church. That should be our concern. We need to be praying for their spiritual growth. And this is a big one here, guys, and I hope you take this to heart, a faithful testimony. To have a faithful testimony. 1 Thessalonians 5.24 says, Faithful is he that calleth you who also will do it. See, God has been faithful to us. And we understand that anything in and of ourselves is going to fail. But if we turn our lives wholly under, the God, under our Lord and we surrender ourselves, he's doing the work in and through us. So he's the one that's ultimately going to do that. We even pray or, or sing about it today in Galatians chapter 2, verse 20. It's the life that I now live in the flesh. I live by the faith of the Son of God, you see? But we need to be as faithful to Him as He has been to us. Be an example of Christ to others. And if you take something home, please take this, because this is kind of a challenge here. Don't ever be an example to where someone can blame the ministry. Don't ever be an example. Don't let anything come out of your mouth. Don't let any of your actions be revealed that they can blame the ministry. To be able to say, well, if you are what a Christian is, I don't want to have anything to do with it. See, we have to be that example. When you lead a new person to Christ, this new babe in Christ, are we going to be good examples to them and show them the proper way to live for Jesus? Or are we just going to sweep some things under the, the carpet and pretend like they've never happened? See, we cannot afford to be able to be unfaithful unto our Lord because it's going to make a difference in our community. And we need to remain a faithful soul winner. My prayer is that all of us here would become addicted to soul winning. That when you see somebody, you would see them as God's people. And that you would really apply to your life what we learned the first week is the value of one soul. Value of one person. So as we're closing here in this study for this week, we're going to close with the same question we started with. Acts 9, 6. Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? And we're just going to take a few minutes that you get to spend time with your Lord. And my prayer is that you will ask him that question and you will ask it sincerely. And then that you will develop in your life a designed purpose to go out and to be used of God. This should be a natural question for all of us as believers. But we can't be afraid to get involved in the lives of others. Lord, what wilt thou have to do? Go ahead and stand. And I'm just going to pray quickly, and um, through this prayer, I'm going to give you the opportunity. Right after the prayer, you're going to have the opportunity just to spend some time with the Lord.
You can come up here at the altar, spend some time with him right there in your seats. But please take the challenge of what wilt thou have me do. Lord, right now you've spoken to us and you've showed us the importance and the responsibility that we have when it comes to this next generation of Christians. Help us to not take it lightly, Lord God. Work in the